Joshua chapter 5, what I want to do is read where I'm going to preach from. I'm just going to read uh, verses 13 through 15 and then share with you from verses 13 through 15 as the Lord has told me to share with you. Cool? This is the word of God in the book of Joshua chapter 5 verses 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the ground and he worshiped and he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off uh, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Father, in Jesus' name, would you help us as we look at this passage to know what it is that you desire for us and from us? Would you do more of a work in my heart than anybody else's? Would you let it be known that you're God, that I'm your servant, and I'm saying all these things according to your word and not my own? I pray that you would hear me so that all of the people of earth may know through what you do this afternoon that you're God, not just the people here at MCC, but the people uh, that are all over this city, all over this country, and all over this world, through what you do right now, through what you say right now, would come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, we pray that by the time we are done, that you have said things and done things that help us to know that only you could be speaking. Um, I pray more than anything else um, that when we walk out of here, we would love you more. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So uh, Lexi told you that I direct a Christian sports camp. It is called Summer's Best Two Week City Kids. I have the opportunity to train athletes and teach them what it looks like to know Jesus and then to love Jesus with everything that they do. We basically try to answer the question, was it, what does it look like to love Jesus as a dot, 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 dot? So if you are an IT person, if you're an athlete, if you are a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a whatever you might be, however you might fill, out that, fill in that blank, we ask the question, how do we love Jesus doing that? Now, you might listen to the passage that I just read and go, what does that have to do <laughs> with what you just read? And I'm gonna tell you everything. What I'm about to tell you is the secret to life. Uh, in fact, when I asked the Lord, hey, how do you want me to sum this up for everybody? What title do you want me to have? Stuff like that, because I'm not a sermon title person. He said, just tell them it's that simple. That's all he wants you to know. It's that simple. So these three verses, God wants you to know it's that simple. Let me first give you context of what we're about to read. For those of you who know the Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, that he goes into Jericho and the walls come tumbling down, right? This is before that happens, even before he gets the instruction to walk around Jericho. What has happened through Joshua chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 is that Joshua is now taking over the people of Israel. Moses is dead, and Joshua has sent out spies to go look at the land. They meet this prostitute named Rahab who tells them that everybody in Jericho is afraid of them. And they're afraid of them because they've heard about the Red Sea. Now, most people don't think about this. As we've been studying through Joshua as a staff, I just want to remind you of something that you may miss if you're reading the text. The Red Sea happened before they went into the wilderness. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. So these people were still afraid of hearing about the Red Sea, even though it was more than 40 years ago. I want you to think about that. So it's not like the Red Sea just happened like two months ago and they're still afraid. These people who are afraid have heard about these Jews that are coming out of Egypt that have been in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're still afraid of hearing about the Red Sea, which happened more than 40 years ago. Stands to reason then that some of the people who are afraid weren't even alive when God split the Red Sea, right? They've heard the story from mom and dad or grandma and granddad about what happened to these people that they haven't even met yet. They're getting ready to go into Jericho, and what happens right before uh, Joshua is getting ready to cross over, they come to uh, a place... And as they come to that place, the manna stops. So if you know anything about your Bible, you know that God was feeding them through manna and quail miraculously. And you see then in verse 12 that they eat, uh, before verse 12, they eat the Passover. Once they eat the Passover, uh, this day I've rolled away the reproach of, from, of Egypt from you, verse 9. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal. That's where they were camped. It's right across from the plains of Jericho, according to what we see in verse 10. And verse 12 says, Then the manna stopped on that day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. It came to pass then that Joshua, 
all of a sudden there's this dude in front of him with a sword drawn. Now, I'm going to have you put yourself in Joshua's shoes for just a second, and then I'm going to have you put yourself in the shoes of the person, like I was saying last night, whenever we read the scripture, sometimes we just need to make it more simple and just look at it as a literary document, and you just see who the characters are. So one character is Joshua, another character is this person who just appears. So get that in your mind's eye. You are just standing there, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's somebody standing in front of you, and their sword is drawn. The crazy thing is, most of the time when you see this happen in scripture, Somebody is afraid is what the Bible says, right? The angel shows up and then that person is deathly afraid. That ain't what happened with Joshua. No, Joshua is the warrior. The first time, we, one of the first times we hear about Joshua is when he's getting to fight the Amalekites. Joshua was a slave and he became a general of an army and was really good at it. And so when Joshua sees this person, Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries? Because in my mind, if you read through the book of Joshua, I think Joshua is about it, about it. Joshua is a warrior, and Joshua is like, if this is what we doing, I just need a sword. Like, I, is this what we doing? That's what Joshua is trying to figure out. Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? Whose team are you on? So that I know how to interact with you. Should I fight you? Right? Because I'm not afraid of you. I'm just trying to figure out if I should fight you. Three, th three things I want to put into your conscience tonight to talk about this afternoon, not tonight, to talk about it's that simple. The first one is worship. Because a lot of times we hear about worship, but we don't really know what it means. In the Christian world, a lot of times we don't define stuff. So we use words like love, grace, mercy, worship, and we just never say what it is, but we all talk around it. This is the coolest part of this text. Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he responds with no. Right? Are we going to Pineapple Express or Taco Bell? No. <laughs> Which, which doesn't really answer the question, right? But he says, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. In other words, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. Like, this is not about you and your war. And there are tons of times where we are looking at God, remember I'm talking about worship first, as if God needs to be on our side so we can do whatever we want to do. We pray to God as if, hey, we got something we want to do and we need your help, Right? Not you've got something to do and you've called me to it. It's more like, hey, man, like I want to graduate. So I need your help on this test. I want to do X. So I need your I need you to do something for me. I need you to hook me up because you are ultimately the from Aladdin or my sugar daddy. Like that's how we treat God. <laughs> but this text, he just levels the plane. No, I, I ain't here. I, I'm not here to take sides. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. I think what he's saying is not that I'm not for you or that I'm not against you, I think what he's trying to say is you got the wrong focus. So then the Bible says Joshua's response is that he falls down to the earth and he worships. Now, generally when you hear the word worship, that's not the context in which you hear it, right? Normally when somebody says we're about to worship, you see a guitar up front, you see a keyboard, you see people lifting their hands, like that's what people think of. Can I tell y'all something that may shock you if you don't already know it? I don't want to force it on you, but can I tell it to you? Yes. This word in Hebrew, so the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, New Testament primarily in Greek, but Old Testament, this word in Hebrew is shakah. It's this word that just means to do obeisance, to bow down, to genuflect, to put yourself in front of somebody. If you are an old kung fu fan like I am, like old kung fu movies, anytime somebody gets beat, what do they do? They fall to their knees and they hang their head. Almost like, okay, I give up, you can do whatever you want to with me, right? Generally, when somebody loses, that's the response. They are falling to their knees, and they're going face down, and they're going prostrate. They're putting themselves low to the ground. That's what this word means. Can I tell you that the first time this word was ever used in Scripture, does anybody know the first time this word was ever used in Scripture? Don't feel bad if you don't. Most people don't know this. The first time that this word is ever used in Scripture, and I want you to turn there if you've got a Bible, is in Genesis chapter 22. Now, if you are a Bible reader, you might already know when I say Genesis chapter 22, what Genesis chapter 22 entails or what it means. I'll pick that up later. Please don't let me forget to pick that up. Genesis 22 is when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. And this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, he's going to go and sacrifice Isaac. And in verses 4 and 5, 
I'm going to start at actually verse 1. Came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, the only one that you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He took two young men with him. He took his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering. He arose and he went to the place where God showed him. On the third day, which is remarkable because Jesus writes, anyway, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, listen, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go over there and worship, and then we will come back to you. This word. So the same word that is used for Joshua, seeing this man with a sword drawn, and the Bible says he fell down in front of him and worship. We see that same word that God tells Abraham to go sacrifice his son on an altar. And he says, hey, we're going to go worship. We're going to go bow down. We're going to go give up. And then we'll come right back. When we think of worship, we are not generally thinking of giving up the thing you love most. But that's what it's about. At the moment, I just want you to be reminded of this. There is a man standing with a sword. And Joshua takes the position of falling down at this man's feet. You understand that if this man wants to, with that sword in his hand, he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> Joshua is in a sense then putting himself in a position where he says, I am giving you full authority over me. You can do with me whatever you want. I am not in a position, listen, I am not in a position to fight back. I'm just in a submissive position to give you whatever you want at this point and whatever you are asking for. That, my friends, is worship. When Abraham is saying, we're going to go worship and then we'll come back, he's saying, I'm not going to go fight with God. I'm going over that with my only son, the one that I love. I'm going to do what he told me to do. I'm going to lay down in front of him and then we'll be back. Because as Romans 4 tells us, Abraham believed that God was able to raise his son even if he did have to kill him, but he didn't believe he would have to kill him, I don't think. I think he knew God's going to do something. In fact, when the question of all of the Old Testament is asked by Isaac, Isaac says, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What does Abraham say? God himself will provide a lamb. The secret to your life is worship. Here's the one problem. Generally, when we think of worship, we think worship is something you have to do, right? But worship is a response to something that's already happened inside of you. Joshua already asked the question, are you for us or for our enemies? When he hears, no, I'm the captain of the Lord's army, he, his body responds by saying, I will put myself in this position. That's what worship is about. When worship really happens, life outside of your body changes because worship has happened on the inside. So if you're finding yourself with vices, you find yourself running from God, you find yourself running away from things that are true and right, I can tell you your problem is not a sin problem, your problem is a worship problem. Because you are saying, God, take this from me, not God, I give this to you. There's a difference between the person with the sword drawn, John Bones Jones in your behind and putting you in submission, for those of you who know who John Bones Jones is, right? There's a difference between I'm going to put you in a submissive hold to where you cannot get up and you are willingly dropping to your knees and bowing your head in front of this person. There's a difference between God putting you in circumstances because you are hard-headed to where you have to listen and you willingly saying, hey, I will do whatever you tell me to do. So you probably don't have a sin problem. You probably, we have a worship problem. Because we don't understand obeisance, not obedience yet, we're going to get to that in a second, but because we don't understand when I truly follow God, I must then give him everything in my life. There's not a part of my life that he doesn't have. That means whatever your degree is going to be in, whatever your major is, the reason you're at MC, all of that has to be him foundationally. Whatever you want to do in life has to be him foundationally. Everything a Christian does should be full-time Christian vocational ministry. There is no such thing as, well, I'm going to be a business person and I'm a Christian, right? Like the reality is either you are a believer or you're not. You can drive like a believer or not drive like a believer, but, but when you know Jesus, Jesus then should impact everything you say, everything you do, and everything you think because of <coughs> worship. 
Joshua is only in this, in this position because Joshua makes the choice uh, to worship when he recognizes who he's talking to. Kind of like there are times where my kids, I will be in the house, they won't know that I'm in the house, and they will say something disrespectful to their mama, and I'll come around the corner and say, who are you talking to? <laughs> like, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Go apologize to her. That was my wife before she was your mama. Who are you talking to? <laughs> but sometimes they don't recognize the authority, right? They don't recognize who they're speaking with because they just, listen, they don't recognize the authority that they speak with because they just want what they want. And sometimes we do God the same way. We talking to him like he done lost his everlasting mind. Like, who, God, what are you doing? Like, this is my life. It's like, well, is it? Because if I stop for one second thinking about you, you don't exist anymore. So we often will treat God as if he owes us something when it's like, no, we owe him everything. So then in Joshua chapter four, not only do we see worship, here's the second part. Not only does he bow down, but then he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? A lot like what we hear uh, Samuel say, right? Hey, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Sometimes we say, listen, Lord, for your servant is speaking, right? We want God to hear us more than we want to hear him. If you don't hear anything else I say tonight, this is one of the things that you need to hear regarding worship and regarding willingness. The second thing I want to talk to you about when I say it's that simple. So you may not have a sin problem, you got a worship problem. Second thing, everybody's capable. Who's willing? That's the question. In fact, Jesus said it this way to his disciple, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. What he's saying is, you might have the capability to do it, but if you don't make the choice, it doesn't matter. And there are five uniquely human things that you have, characteristics that you have that are different than angels, different than animals. I want to give you those five very quickly if I can remember all five of them because I didn't write them down. I just hope I can remember them. Um, yep, it ain't going nowhere. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, got it. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Came to me. Motivation is the first one. What do you desire? What do you want? Right? The second one then is volition. That's what I'm talking about. Volition. What do you choose to do? You can say you want it, but if you don't choose to do it, if you don't choose to make it happen, then it likely ain't going to be magic, right? So what do you want? And then what are you willing to do to get what you want? What are you choosing? Everybody's capable, but what are you willing to do? My kids make me laugh. They always like, oh, I, I, can we have this for dinner? Like, can, we, can we eat out? <laughs> sure, we can eat out. You going to pay for it? Their response, I can, I don't care if you can. I'm asking if you will. Think about it. Motivation is I want to eat something that's really, really good that I don't pay for. But volitionally, they don't want to choose it. The third one is cognition. What do I think about what I think about? What do I think about the things that I'm thinking about? That's cognition. That is something that angels don't necessarily do like we do and animals don't do like we do. Animals act off of instinct. Angels act off of how God built them. We can volitionally think about our choices. We can exercise them wisdom to say yes and no and to do different things. Fourth one is emotion. We have the opportunity to have an energy that is inside of us that works itself outward. Five primary emotions. If you've seen the movie Inside Out, you know what they are. Fear, anger, yeah. sadness, disgust, and joy, right? Yeah. Joy tells us something that needs to be celebrated. It's an energy towards celebration. Sadness is an energy toward loss. Anger is an energy toward righteousness. Something's not right. Disgust is an energy toward something being off in a faux pas kind of way. Right? Uh, what did I miss? Fear is an energy that tells us we're in danger or tells us something's not safe. We have that opportunity. Last one is called apprehension. We have the opportunity to understand the consequences of our choices and the significance of what they are. Everybody's capable. The question is, are you willing? I can share the gospel with my roommate. Do you? Will you? I could go be a missionary, will you? I can love Jesus and, and, and play sport at the same time. Oh, sweet, will you? The question is not, can you do these things? The question is, will you do these things? But I can go to, after this, I can go and fellowship with everybody. The question is, will you? What are the choices that you're making and why are you making those choices? Joshua says, what do you want to say? which tells you something about Joshua's worship. It brought him to a place where he's willing to hear more than he's willing to speak. He's willing to seek to understand what God wants for him before he wants God to understand him because he knows God understands him. But he's at this point where you can tell he's going, hey, what do you want to say? Because I'm willing to listen. Do you know, do you remember how this started? Right, this started with he just see a dude with a sword in his hand. Hey, look, who you, whose side you on? 
No. Okay, what do you, what do you want to say? He falls down, he worships. What do you want to say? This is the coolest part from worship to willingness, third thing, work. As a believer, I don't know about you, but particularly when you enter the Christian space, everybody's all about work. What have you done for God lately, right? They only Janet Jackson at some level. Like, what have you done for God lately? Everybody wants you to work for him. Everybody wants you to do for God. Hey, let's do this stuff. Here's the coolest part of this passage. When he says, what do you want to say to your servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy. Listen, and Joshua did so. It's that simple. Joshua could have said, but now, nah, man, like I'm, I'm trying to make sure the whole world knows you. Like I want to go be a mission. I want to just take your shoes off. I ain't asking you right now to do nothing hard. I ain't asking you to do nothing you ain't done every day. He just tells him to take his shoes off. Listen, there's nothing special about the place where he's standing except God's presence is there. I'm going to say that again. There's nothing special about the place that Joshua is standing except God's presence is there. Joshua was standing there before he saw the man. He had to take his shoes off. When the man leaves, Joshua's going to stand there again. He ain't got to take his shoes off. Because what makes, that space pe- <laughs> what makes that place special is God's presence. You know what I believe God is doing right here when he says, you know, what do you want to say to your servant? Take your shoes off for the place once you stand this. He's reminding him of worship. Before we can get to the work, before we get to the doing, before we get to the gospel sharing, before we get to the evangelism, before we get to the discipleship, before we get to all of that other stuff, I think God is just saying, can you take your shoes off when I tell you to? All right, my oldest son is 16, and um, he doesn't have his permit yet, uh, but what we have been practicing, so I live on a campground, and so we've been practicing on the campground where really, I mean, it's virtually difficult to hurt somebody unless you do something really, really irresponsible, right? So he's practicing there. And so as I share with him, I'm like, listen, son, the most important thing is the break. That's the most important thing. More important than the ignition, right? Because you can be in neutral without the ignition on by accident, and your car can still roll. Hopefully you know that, right? So, brother, but buddy, the most important thing on this vehicle is the brake. What, is, what was his question when we first started? How do I make it go? Hold up, brother. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I love you. I love you. But you going ain't the point. Like, we need to first get real familiar with this break. Because when you're going too fast, you need the break. When you're about to hit something in front of you, you need the break. When the keys are not in the ignition, but it happens to be in neutral because somebody didn't actually do what they were supposed to do, you need the break to stop. And if you don't know how to stop, you won't really understand the privilege of going. If you don't know how to stop, when you see a stop sign, when you see a red light, you have to know how to stop. When you see a vehicle in front of you, you have to know how to stop. Stopping is how we learn to keep people safe. Very rarely are you gonna go faster to keep somebody safe. Let me jump back into the spiritual for just a second because some of y'all are just looking at me like I'm talking about a car. You understand that I'm talking about your relationship with God, right? If you don't know how to take off your shoes, if you don't know how to just pause and listen to the little thing he's telling you to do to just read your Bible, to just love people, to just be nice and kind. If you can't do that, how in the world do you expect to be a missionary overseas? If you can't, when God tells you to do the simplest thing, anybody know the story of Naaman, right? Naaman wants to be healed of his leprosy. Hey, look, man, just go wash in the Jordan River. Man, like, why got to wash in Jordan? <laughs> Brother, like, you want to be healed or not? Worship. What is he willing to do? He, man, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go bathe somewhere else. Jordan nasty. So is your leprosy, man. Go bathe in the Jordan. (laughs) Right? It's funny, but it's true. Often we're trying to do the big, amazing thing for God. God, if you give me 20 million, I will. Can you handle the dollar he gave you? God, I want to do this over here. Over, But yeah, but can you, can you, can, with with the people he put in your house already? Right? We want to steward and handle all of this other stuff. But I'm going, yo, if you can't even steward what God put right in front of you at this moment, if you can't steward the people in this room, I don't know how you expect to steward this campus, much less this city, much less this state, much less this country, much less the world. If you can go to Chipotle now, and because of your own busy schedule, when God is telling you to talk to that person right there that you don't know, and you can look at God's face and go, I don't know who that is, I'm out. And you walk out. How in the world can you handle when God is going to tell you to talk to somebody else? 
We, we want to be, you know, we want to share the gospel with Michael Jordan, Kevin Durant, LeBron James. We can't share the gospel with this random person we don't even know. Am I making sense to everybody? Yeah. Like, we long to do the big thing for God, but we half the time can't do the small thing for God. And so when you look at this passage, it's real simple. What do you want to say? Take off your shoes. And Joshua did it. What if Joshua had been like, man, there's rocks out here. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the terrain, God? Like, yeah, I'm, do I have to walk once I take off my... What if he'd have done that? Sand's going to get everywhere. <laughs> I'm going to have sand in my shoes. I'm going to have to wash my feet when I get back. <laughs> he could have done that, right? And we've seen people do that in Scripture. That God tells them something. Moses, I can't speak, though, man. I got this speech impediment. I got this problem. Jeremiah, I'm too young. Right? We see people all through Scripture make excuses. These four words are some of the most convicting words in the Bible. And Joshua did so. He didn't make excuses. He didn't fight God. He, I'll take my shoes off. Do you know if you read through chapter 6 what came after he just obeyed that thing? God gave him the entire plan for conquering Jericho. Mm. Can you give another secret to life? Maybe the thing you're praying for has not come to you because you haven't obeyed the thing in front of the thing that you're praying for. <coughs> Maybe you're asking God for something out here that he's already given you something to obey right here and you're not obeying this. And he's like, yo, I want to give you this, but you can't take your shoes off. Like my son, look, brother, I want you to drive a vehicle, but I can't hand you the keys if you don't understand the brake. If all you want to do is go fast on the road, I, I can't give you the keys because you don't understand the brake. There are tons of basketball players that I train that come in our gym, and for whatever reason, they want to show me that they can take the ball between their legs, but they do it completely inefficiently, right? Mm -hmm. So they take the ball between their legs. That when they put the ball between their legs, the ball goes behind them and their head is down and their booty's high and their knees are like this. And I'm like, so sweet. You can take the ball between your legs, but you can never use that in a game. Like, that's never going to happen in a game. Mm -hmm. So do you want to learn how to take the ball between your legs? Their response, I already know how to take the ball between my legs. Okay, cool. Um, I want you to use that move and I want you to get to the basket. And so they use that move, I take the ball from them. And I'll do it like five times in a row to where they get frustrated, <laughs> right? Am I trying to be mean? No. no, I'm trying to show them what you're doing is completely ineffective. It's not going to work in a game. But then when I go back to, hey, look, let me show you how to do that. You have to first get a wide base. Once you get a wide base, you sink the bottom. Once you sink the bottom, now when you take the ball between your legs here, the ball actually comes right beside you, and it looks more like a pass. You can use it effectively. So I'll use it on them, go right behind them, and then I'll lay the ball in. And I'll do that like five times so they get frustrated. So they know, hey, you can't stop me doing this because I'm chest to chest with you looking dead in your eyeballs, right? <laughs> it's not because I'm a good basketball player. It's because there are some standard things that always work. Why am I using that analogy? Because when it comes to working for God, the fundamentals of just knowing who he is and spending time with him, Jesus was real simple with it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And you say you love me, just do what I tell you to do. Mm -hmm. It's like that kid, like I got eight kids, right? And it's like my son Asher, who is five, and I've been through this with all my kids, right? Go to bed, Asher. Okay. Five minutes later, Ash is still up in the kitchen getting water. Well, Daddy, I needed to get some water. Because you know we'll never turn that down because we're a healthy family, right? I'm like, buddy, you could have got water before I told you to go to bed. I, I, I know, Dad, but I, I, I know I'm supposed to drink water. All right, man, go ahead, drink your water, and go to bed. He starts to walk up the stairs. He'll run back in the living room. I love you, Mom. <laughs> Gives Mommy a hug. I love you, Dad. Gives me a hug. Hey, bro, if you love me, go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> if you love me, do what I said. <laughs> My man will go upstairs, he'll come back down. It's my favorite thing in the world. It's the cutest thing in the world, but it's completely disobedient. Right. Two fingers in his mouth, he'll come down. Mommy, will you come tuck me in the taco and pray? That's what he says, right? Cute, right? Super cute. And I'm like, and that's super, get your behind upstairs, <laughs> right? But I love you. I want mommy to, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. What you're saying is, what you desire is now more important than the authority who loves you enough to tell you to, to, tell you to go to bed so that you don't have a hard day tomorrow because you don't know when you don't get sleep that you're not a good student. Right. So you want to stay up, but then that creates a harder day for you tomorrow. Now, I'm looking out for your well-being in that way, but you acting like I ain't looking out for your well-being. Jump back to the spiritual. For some of us, God is telling us it might literally be for you go to bed, and you're like, but man, what, I want to stay up and share the gospel with all right, share the gospel tomorrow at noon. Never forget this, I was in college. I just thought of this story. I got two stories to tell. If I remember the second one, I'll tell it. 
I was in college, I was sitting at my desk one day, and um, I was studying, and I didn't want to study, if I'm going to be completely honest, but I was studying. And I looked to my right, and my Bible was sitting there in front of me where I was studying, and I picked up my Bible, and I put it on top of my schoolwork, and I started reading my Bible. And I sensed the Holy Spirit say, hey, you need to close that Bible, and you need to study. And I was like, that had to be Satan. Why would God ever tell me to close my Bible? Like, that ain't Satan. That ain't God. So, um, because I really, I mean, it was, it was loud and emphatic. So I closed my Bible, I started studying, and I'm like, yo, that was the weirdest experience I've ever had. That could not have been God, and now I'm questioning whether or not I'm saved. I'm kind of kidding. <laughs> Never forget it. I go, shout out to Camlin Rook. I go to lunch with my friend Camlin Rook, and I tell him about my experience. And he said, Timothy, you know that's interesting. He said, why did you feel like you needed to read your Bible at that point? And I said, well, I hadn't spent as much time in the Word that day, at, you know, yesterday as I wanted to. And so I wanted to spend more time in the Word. He said, cool. Why didn't you do that at 7 o'clock? Now, here's what you need to know. Everybody knew at 7 o'clock at that time, Dragon Ball Z was coming on at 7 and 7.30, and then Batman Beyond was coming on at 8. And everybody knew you don't go in Pope's room between 7 and 8.30 because he watching Dragon Ball Z and Batman Beyond, right? He said, why didn't you do it at 7? And I started laughing because I was like, well, because I was, was going to watch Dragon Ball Z at 7. And he said, you know, it's really, I'll never forget these words. He said, it's easy to leave what we don't want to do to do what we think we should be doing. And I think it was the Lord saying, hey, man, I want you to love me with your schoolwork, too. Guess what I wasn't willing to do? I wasn't willing to give up Dragon Ball Z and Batman Beyond to read my Bible. But I'll give up schoolwork in a heartbeat. <coughs> I was working at a camp. I think this is the last story. And there was a young man named Cecil who came up to me at 1030 at night. Now, at this camp, we had this thing called TAPS. Total and perfect silence is what it stands for. Um, some people will say talking and playing stops. But after that time, there's no more talking, right? Never forget this. I was working at this camp. Uh, we had just put all the kids down. Taps had been called. It was around 1030. This kid came up to me at like 1035. And he said, hey, man, I want to pray to receive Christ as my Savior. I said, all right, cool. Hey, man, um, catch me tomorrow at free time. Now, this was after I graduated from college, so I knew, right? But I said, catch me tomorrow at free time. And free time was about 5 o'clock right before dinner. So catch me tomorrow at free time. I'll, this is where I'll be. He said, what? So catch me tomorrow at free time. If you, hey, wait the Holy Spirit working now. Holy Spirit will continue working in your heart tomorrow. But it's taps. Like, I'm not going to disobey. Listen, I'm not going to disobey the authority that told me to put you behind the bed. I didn't say it like that. But I'm not going to disobey the authority that told me to put you to bed. No more talking after taps in order to let you come to know Jesus. You want to come to know Jesus, the Spirit is going to be working in you tomorrow. He came and met me the next day at free time, and he asked me why I did that. I told him the same thing I told y'all. And I said, there is something to obedience. And if God is working in you then, he's going to work in you now. Dude came to know Jesus. He still tells his story all over this country about that time and that day. Why is that significant? Because what I could have done is said, hey, this dude is asking to meet Jesus right now. Like, I want to be super Christian, which would have been more about me. But my authority had already said, this is the rules. Hey, catch me tomorrow. Then I had to fall on God's grace to say, hey, God told me to obey my authority in this book. If he told me to obey my authority, I'm going to obey my authority and leave the rest of the chips up to him. But sometimes we want to disobey God as if our disobedience is somehow doing him a favor. No. And Joshua did so. So what is it that God is telling you to do, has been telling you to do? But you like, I'm not qualified, I'm not good enough, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Listen, it's this simple. You obey or you don't. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. <clears throat> he telling you to do it, do it. Just do it. What you got to lose? Just do it. If you don't do it, you got a lot to lose. Right? But if you do it, the greatest thing you have to lose is your fear of doing what God has called you to do. Father, in Jesus' name, help me to know that. Help us to know that. Help us to walk with you. Help us to understand you. Help us to know that it's just that simple, that worship is often our problem, that we're not really bowing down in front of you and having you as King of kings and Lord of lords, our chief authority. Help us to understand that many of us have said what we can and can't do, but we haven't really been willing. We haven't used that volition regarding our motivation and our cognition and our emotion to lead us to an apprehension, an understanding of what you're doing, that we might join you where you're working. God, then there are some of us in this room that we really do want to work for you, but we want it to be something big. We, want it to, we, we don't want it to be that simple. 
We want it to be magnificent and miraculous. But often you're just asking us to do simple, ordinary, everyday things. I pray that you give us the grace and the willingness to obey. For anybody who doesn't know you that's in this room, I pray that you convict their hearts to help them to know that it really is that simple. Either they can come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, or not. And there are consequences to both. Consequence of not knowing you is spending eternity apart from you. Consequence of knowing you is being in a relationship with you and understanding the love that has loved us since the beginning. Help us, Lord, to make the decision to know you. In Jesus' name.